Friends, it's awesome to be here. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for all the organizers. I know tons of work has gone on behind the scenes to invite people, just to organize things, and to make sure things are running smoothly. A special thanks to the Veritas Forum itself for, for being, uh, you know, being a big coordinator for all of these events. Most importantly, yeah, it's your mic on. Mic's on. Okay, guys. And uh, most importantly, I just want to thank you guys for, for your time to come here. I just hope you know, this next hour is. It's actually worth your time to spend on a, on a night at a college. So. so let me tell you a couple of things about college that I love. You know, the great thing about college to me is that now is the, probably the only time in your life where you get to struggle with big questions. You know, you can just have a, have a time to enjoy time in your dorms, talking to your friends, having pizza, and asking these tough questions. You know, the title of this talk is, is actually addressing some of these questions. Let me give you some, right? What is the nature of reality? What is real? Is there a God? Can we prove it? What does science have to say to all of this? And here's the question I personally struggle with. Why are infinity scarves so popular? <laughs> Isn't it just a scarf? <laughs> I don't know what the new term is, right? But, um, Anyway, today, today we're going to talk about these big ideas, right? Like God, science, reality. Now, every one of us has our own perception of what is real. You know, how is it that what I think is real is different than what you think is real? Who, who has it right? Which one of us wins? You know, there are these different notions of even what reality means. Let me give you an example. Here's a notion of what it means to be mathematically real. This is called a gauss bonnet theorem. I'm not sure if you've ever seen this before. Let me just give you a break. You know it's going to be a math lecture, right? So, let me just give you a break. <laughs> so what it says is that the integral, which just means add up, that's all the integration means. If you add up the curviness at every point on a surface, it's equal to 2 pi times the Euler characteristic of that surface. Which means you take a sphere, every point on the sphere has some level of curviness. If you add it all up, it's going to be 4 pi. If I stretch the sphere, the total curviness is still going to be 4 pi. Although the little curviness at every different point is completely changing. It's one of the most amazing results, one of my favorite results that talks about shape. Is this a notion of reality? Some of us here in this room, I guarantee, are getting turned on by this result. <laughs> but many might agree with uh, Stephen Colbert when he says the equations of the devil sentences. <laughs> so, so what is real? You know, is, is math real or just complete figment of imagination? Some game that certain people play. But let me give you this other snapshot of reality. Here's Stephen Hawking's most recent book. Here's what he writes. He writes, the universe does not have a single existence or history, but rather every possible version of the universe exists simultaneously. It's his notion of the multiverse. Right? That means at this second, right now, this concept of reality is happening, along with every other possible thing you could be doing at this very second. And all of those things are real. And this is only one snapshot of all of the realities that's out there. So, is that reality? Has physics told us that there's this other concept of reality? Now, what does it even mean to talk about what's real? Look, my friends, for thousands of years, the notion of reality has always been linked to a notion of a God. But today, we're in 21st century America. You know, reality is no longer linked to church or a measurement of what holy days are. That's not how we measure what things are real. Look, there's a belief today that religion is no longer relevant. What it is, here's what religion is. It's a scaffolding. It's just there to hold things in place until science comes and explains to us what's going on. In time, you don't need the scaffolding anymore. Might as well take it off now, because it's just fake anyway. So let me give you an example of what this is. This is Michio Kaku, a famous physicist. Here's what he writes. It's a rephrasing of a quote by Arthur C. Clarke, and he writes the following thing. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from divinity. Which means you have a notion of a god that can do something. Just wait, and science will replace that god. Just wait. Is that what it means to be real? Science, my friends, is the new measurement of reality. Black is the new white. Science is our new god. So here's the question, how do we get this way? This is not the way the world has always been. How do we get this way? Let me step back and give you a little snapshot of what's going on. You know, during the time of the Renaissance, art and music and science and literature were all mixed together. You have these works of Da Vinci, 
who both was an engineer, a scientist, an artist. He blurred the lines between all these things. Faith, reason, beauty were interconnected. This resulted in paintings, poems, cathedrals, inventions, glorious things. And then, around 1750, after the Renaissance, the Enlightenment era followed. And here's what the Enlightenment said. It said, look, reason must be the primary source of authority. You cannot simply tell me that the sun is in the center of the solar system. You can't just say that because you believe it or you feel it. Prove it, test it, validate it for me. You have to check things out, test it, measure it, evaluate it, not simply accept it by faith. The Enlightenment era pushed us in this direction. And my friends, I'm a huge fan. I love the Enlightenment era. It gives me a job. I do this work as a mathematician. <laughs> it's a huge force in propelling our scientific progress and understanding. It's given us better cars, better medicine, better transportation, better ice cream, better everything. All of this is the Enlightenment era pushed us to test, evaluate, to understand. It's fantastic. Now here's the problem. I think it's been taken to an extreme. I think it's been pushed beyond where it could go. Look, today we try to explain everything through science. Bertrand Russell, one of the most famous philosophers and mathematicians, here's what he has to say. He says, whatever knowledge is attainable must be attained by scientific methods. What science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. It is the only tool of measuring what is real, is what Russell said. Look, we're putting all our chips in the science bucket. Now there's one big consequence of doing this. That consequence is dualism. Let me just give you a snapshot of what I mean by dualism, right? This is the Renaissance era. Here we have art and math together. We have faith and reason together. We have religion, politics, and then the unmeasurable and the unmeasurable together. So what does the Enlightenment era say after the Renaissance? It doesn't say you have to pick one or the other. It actually says you have to pick one versus the other. Right, you see on this side over here, you have the art major who's kind, sensitive, loving, compassionate art student. And on the other side, the thin, calculating, snake like mathematician. <laughs> but sexy in their own way. <laughs> this concept of even religion versus politics. Look, let me just let me just break that down first for just a second. What do I mean by that? Look, religion is our answer to the big questions. Whether you're an atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, Christian, it doesn't matter. We all have some answers to the big questions out there. That's your religious belief. That's your faith statement, what you think this world is about. On the other side is politics. That's the day-to-day -day stuff. What should the tax laws be? What should the divorce laws be? What should be the speeding ticket? Of course, the way you think about the world and big ideas is going to affect the way you handle day-to-day -day stuff. Let's not pretend it doesn't. Right? That's the reality. They're mixed in together. And the Enlightenment era tries to separate it up, cut it up. My friends, I don't want to sterilize this world. I don't want to cut up this world. I don't want to clean up this world. You see, I want to deal with the messy things of the world, the things that are really complicated. I love messy things. Let me give you an example of some messy things I love. Ice cream. I really love it. This, I'm not sure if you've had it before. This is Grater's ice cream. They make this in Columbus, Ohio and in Cincinnati. This is called black raspberry chip. The chocolate chunks are huge. And unlike any ice cream I've had in my life, when you bite it, it melts in your mouth. There is no pain. <laughs> it has so much fat, it goes down so easy. <laughs> Here's something else that's messy that I love. Sex. <laughs> and all the stuff that goes with it. Dating, relationships, marriage, all the junk of the reality of putting up with somebody else. It's messy. And here's the consequence of sex. Here's my family. <laughs> so, the first thing you'll notice is that my wife does not look like me. <laughs> and she'll be the first to say that marriage is the hard, messy thing. But if you marry somebody outside your race, it's harder. Life is harder if you do that. Most people don't agree with what kind of toothpaste they'd like to use if you're married, right? Then you have this other Indian kid who has complete different notions of what real is. Complete different cultural settings. If you think that's tough, if there's two on the right, there's one on the left, right? Their identity is messed up. What's their life going to be like? Indian, dad, Chinese, mom, what's going to happen? And if you think that's tough, then there's a little one, right? On my lap, here she is. Blonde hair. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed, my dream, dream girl. I adore this girl to pieces. 
how is her life going to be in this world, right? With me and my wife and my kids all around her, and she is part of this clan. But this, my friends, is the messiness of reality. I don't want to clean it up because I love it all. I love all of this thing, and I want something that can make sense of the messiness of everything that I see. You see, whatever meaning, whatever truth, whatever reality there is in this world, I needed to address the messiness of my life. Listen, I love science. I love it. I love it. It's a wonderful tool to measure things, to find patterns, to make amazing predictions, but it is not enough to handle the full mess of life. Science is just one language of truth, one tool in an entire toolbox. Look, this is why we have other languages in this world. This is why we need philosophers, writers, theologians, artists, musicians. They're trying to capture the different parts of expressing the complicated immensity of this amazing world. Look, let me show you how different disciplines come together just in math, right? You would think that math is kind of this one corner thing that does its own, that it's amazing how these worlds come together. And many of us think of math, the first thing you think of is that you start getting a little nauseous, right? You're thinking of um, algebra, trig, calc. As I say those words, you know, many of us, yes, I understand. <laughs> few people think of math and say, wow, I think of beautiful pictures. Very few people think like that. Why? Because, here's a quote by John Little that I want to share with you guys. John Little is an amazing number theorist. He said, a heavy warning is to be given. The pictures are not rigorous. This has never had its bluff called and has permanently frightened its victims. What he says is that in math, we somehow think an equation is more true, more honest, more real than a picture. Can you trick people using pictures? Can you deceive people using images? Absolutely. Can you deceive people using algebra? Yeah, totally. You can deceive people using anything, right? The problem is we somehow think pictures are worse than, worse than any other notions of reality. Look, let me give you an example. Let me be really concrete here. These are pictures I drew. What they are are four different examples of four-dimensional objects that have been pushed into 3D. All right, so there they are. Four different things, four different polytopes. A polyhedra, a polygon is 2D, a polyhedra is 3D, a polytope is you know, 4D and higher. So here are four different things that are four-dimensional. Here's a claim. All four things are identical. I claim that the only difference between the four of them is that you're looking at them from a different direction. Now, here's the question. What is the proof? What is the claim? What is the absolute proof that all four of these are identical? There's no proof. There's no proof. Here's what I claim. There's the proof, and here's the proof. This picture is the proof. This is the proof. There it is. It's right there. Just look and figure it out. The answer is, many of you are thinking, well, I can't do it. That's because you suck. <laughs> using visual ways. This is what the Enlightenment era has done. It's ripped up math into pieces to say, dude, the art world is over there. Don't even bring that near the math world. But they're the same things, my friend. They're these different tools that we can use to understand. Let me give you some more examples of what I'm talking about. Math and art are not on opposite sides the way we think they are. They're a lot closer than you think. Here's some examples, right? Origami. This is Robert Sabuda and Matt Reinhardt's work. I think pop-up books are some of the most beautiful works of art out there. They're incredibly hard to make. And uh, these guys are masters of this world. Origami to me is an intersection of math and art. These two worlds that you think are on opposite ends of the spectrum, they're basically the same game. This is gorgeous. Let me give you some examples of how math and art fit together in origami. This is the James Webb Space Telescope. This telescope is the size of a tennis court. And what we want to do is we want to put this in space, and it's going to crush Hubble in 2018 when it launches. It's going to get images more beautiful than you could ever imagine. There's only one problem. How do you take something the size of a tennis court and launch it into space? And the answer is, you fold it. You fold it into a rocket. You launch it out there, and then you unfold it. Of course, you fold it too much, and all those lines of compression that's going to give you problems is going to give you errors when you start reading the data. And you fold it too little, and it doesn't fit into the rocket. So what we want to do is use origami ideas to actually think about the right ways of doing this. Here's something else. The Kurobayashi stent. There was a young lady, she was um, 
She was a doctor. She was doing residency. She went to visit her friend in Japan. She went to the Origami Museum just on the day off that she had, walked around, came back, and she realized she can design a stent based on origami holding techniques. A stent is something you put inside your arteries to unclog it so the blood can flow again. And so something like this turns into something like this, just from origami folding techniques. And now it's worth over $2 billion. So this notion of how math and art fit together, it's truly amazing. Here's something else. This is, this is just plants folding and unfolding. There's an example of a fern. You know, when plants actually grow and leaves are formed, have you ever noticed during the, during the time of spring that all of a sudden everything looks green. Now what wasn't green before just looked like within a week, boom, everything happens. And here's why. Plants have actually created their leaves and if they grow it at the right stage, sort of in a linear way, it's going to kill them because it can't absorb photosynthesis at a young age. But if they wait too late to start growing their leaves, then it's not fast enough for them. It's going to kill them because it needs the energy fast. So here's what plants do. They make the leaves and they fold it. And when the right time comes, they immediately unfold, unfold it. It's amazing what they do. And they're doing origami design in plants. We're trying to figure out how this is all working out. How nature's trying to tell us all these things. Here's something else that has to do with origami. Protein folding. The way proteins come out of your... I'm sorry if I heard a nerve right there. <laughs> the way proteins come out of your body, it's just little linkages that come and fold and spin and form some three-dimensional tube that can interact with enzymes sort of the right way. And if the protein gets folded incorrectly, you get mad cow disease or you get Alzheimer's. So if we can find out simple ideas of how to fold sheets of paper, then maybe we have a way of understanding how to cure Alzheimer's. If we can understand how folding and unfolding works. These disciplines that you think, oh, dude, folding and unfolding, that's silly. That's an art project. It turns out it's in one of the most cutting edge things, both in math and in science. And here's something else that kind of wraps it all up together. This is a work by Eric and Martin Demain. Eric Demain was, um, is a professor at MIT. He was 19 when he got his PhD. And uh, he has PhD at the University of Waterloo. Superstar, really bright kid, solved one of the great unsolved problems in this field. And uh, an MIT in the CS department, the computer science department, said, what do you want, my friend? You have a tenure track job at MIT. It is, for what he did, the best job in the world. And Eric said, I'm not sure about that. And MIT goes, you're kidding, right? Like, what, what else do you need, my friend? And they say, you know, my dad's a wonderful job. And of course, I'm telling the story. But um, he said, what does your dad do? He goes, well, he's a glass boy. So MIT built this dad a glass blowing studio, two floors down from Eric's office. And Martin Demain, his dad, has an office right next to Eric. Together they've written over 300 papers. And uh, Eric just a few years ago won the MacArthur Genius Grant around the age of 25. $500,000, no questions asked, just for being smart. And uh, so MIT was not foolish in what they did. But let me tell you this story. This is origami that has curves in it made from just flat pieces of paper. And this actually is a work in the Museum of Modern Art in MoMA. It's in, the, in their permanent collection, based on the work of Eric and his dad. So this idea of folding and unfolding, you think in math, you know, that we actually just cornered away into one side to say, dude, that's the technical analytic side. The walls between that and art are really falling apart. Look, my friends, here's my encouragement to you at Davis, right? I know many of you guys really want to graduate, get that amazing job you've been looking for, and take as many courses as you can in your major. Look. Enjoy your major, love your major, do what you can in your major, whether it's philosophy or art or music or science or bio or chem, whatever it is, just enjoy it. But use as much of your other time as you can to learn other things, to learn other classes. And here's why. Those tools in those other classes are going to teach you different things about life. Those tools in your other classes will actually teach you different things about your own major. Don't get obsessed with your one pathetic tool that you're going to use for the rest of your life. Learn the different tools out there. This is the time to do it. When you're working for a company, you will not have the luxury to say, I want to take a semester off and learn. Right? Nobody's going to do that for you. But now you can. This is the last shot you have. This is what college is about. That's my encouragement. Listen, when we think about all of these ideas of math and art and the Renaissance and the Enlightenment fitting together, here's what I want. To me, I want a model. I want a theory, I want a story that encompasses all of these tools, that makes sense of all of them. Look, I'm ambitious. I want a theory of just the things you can measure and do things scientifically. I want a theory of everything. Look, I want to deal with, let me give you some examples of stuff I want to deal with. I want to deal with things like beauty. I want to deal with things like justice. 
like relationships, significance, all of these things that are beyond the scope of science. We are humans, we value all these things. Look, let me give you examples of where we value these things. Do you know that Victoria's Secret doesn't sell clothes using scientific data? What it does is it shows you beautiful, naked women. That's what it does. We value physical beauty. When you go to concerts and when you go to football games, we value and thirst for relationship. We want to be around other people. We want to think and share that experience. Look, this is why people in the world listen to Oprah. This is why they listen to Deepak Chopra. This is why you listen to music. This is why you care about mysticism. Because these tell you that there's some significance beyond us. We're thirsting for this. Look, why do your hearts burn when you watch 12 Years a Slave? When you watch The Godfather? When you watch The Matrix? Have you guys ever seen The Matrix? My favorite part in all of movie dumb is when Neo walks to the metal detective. And they say, excuse me, sir, would you empty your pockets for loose change? And he goes like this, just fill the guns. <laughs> for redemption. There's a thirst in you for retaliation. Neo, set the world right. Bring Morpheus. That's what you're thirsting for. We, our hearts burn for justice. So what theory makes sense of all of these things that we as humans care about? Look, the Enlightenment says every one of these things can be explained by science alone. My friends, we are dealing with issues far more in complexity than dark matter or genetics or gauss bonnet what do I want to deal with? See, to me, science does not have a monopoly on reason. It doesn't have a monopoly on logic. It certainly doesn't have a monopoly on what is real. See, believing that science is the only measurement of truth, to me, is an incredible leap of faith. It's as big a leap of faith as believing in a god. And whether you realize it or not, each one of us are living lives of faith and belief. Here's what David Foster Wallace, this amazing writer, novelist writes. He writes, there is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. Here's what Bob Dylan writes in one of his songs. You gotta have, you gotta have to serve somebody. Maybe the devil, maybe the Lord, but you gotta have to serve somebody. Here's what they're trying to say. We must put our chips in some bucket. And choosing not to commit to a viewpoint is itself a choice. There is no neutral ground. And so to me, which of these choices that are in front of me is the most appealing, is the most exciting, answers my questions, addresses my struggles. To me, there is nothing as satisfying as the Christian worldview. Now, let me be clear. I don't believe in the Christian faith because it gives my life meaning or it's emotionally satisfying. Look, I'm a math professor. There are no emotions to satisfy. <laughs> The reason I believe in physics, the existence of forces and particles that I cannot see, I believe in them, though I cannot see them, is because it is the best explanation of the physical world. Not because physics makes me happy. And the reason I'm a Christian, believe in a God of history who I cannot see, is because this theory best explains my deep questions, this mess of this world, and the hunger that I have for justice and beauty. So let me close by sharing with why I find this faith so compelling. First of all, the Christian faith is not theoretical, it's not philosophical, it's not metaphysical, but here's what it is. It's grounded in history. It makes incredible historical claims and it culminates in what just happened this past weekend, Easter Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus. And this resurrection, this thing that happened, is the linchpin of the entire faith. Look, you cannot use the tools of science to talk about the resurrection because it's a historical event. You can't use the tools of science to talk about whether Abraham Lincoln was shot. You can't use the tools of science to talk about whether George Washington was our first president. But you can use the tools of history. They're a different set of tools. And I think you can use a set of tools of history to talk about the resurrection and it holds water. I'm convinced that the claims of the Christian faith hold. Unlike any system of beliefs, this faith also boldly claims that this beautiful mess of this world is built into the heart of God himself. Look, this is why God in the Christian faith is called Emmanuel, which means God with us in our mess, in our pain. This mess, this junk, is central to the Christian faith. Here are two reasons why. First of all, the death of Jesus. It shows that God does not accept this broken world as it is. Pain and justice are given a solution here. 
Now, some of you might be wondering, wait, isn't the death of Jesus completely weird? You're telling me there's a God of absolute love, and here you're showing it as a God of absolute wrath. Isn't the opposite of love, isn't that wrath just the opposite? How could you have a God that is both? And to me, I think of love and wrath as the same thing. You saw my little girl, right? I adore her to pieces. I love her. Now, if anybody hurts her, if she is in pain and somebody else is causing pain for my girl, there is wrath in me. There is injustice that's being done against her, and I want to set the world right. I want to redeem her and pull her away and punish those who are hurting her. That is the wrath in me. But the opposite of love is not wrath. The opposite of love is indifference. If I didn't care what happened to my girl. So here's what we see. At the cross, we see that God is not indifferent. We see that he pours his wrath on his son due to his love for us. And amazingly, in this death, God shares responsibility for us in our own mess. And the resurrection of Jesus, here's what I find amazing. It's not some spiritual ghost of a resurrection, some body that's walking and doing some amazing spiritual things. It is a flesh and blood resurrection. Here's what Jesus did after he resurrected. He said, can I have some food? I love it. He said, can I have some food? He wants to eat. Dude, I can totally relate. <laughs> <laughs> to me, this shows to God that the physical world matters. Flesh matters. Sex matters. Earth matters. Food matters. See, this beautiful world that I love will not be thrown away, but it'll be redeemed. So here's a question for you. What does the afterlife look like? What does it look like after all of this is gone? In the new heaven, in the new earth, what does that look like? Here's what it looks like to me. It looks like this world. It looks like artists hanging out. It looks like musicians playing music. It looks like inventors inventing academics, doing math. Mm -mm -mm. It is a world <laughs> filled with ice cream. It is a world filled with fashion. It is a world filled with design, filled with poems. But it is this world redeemed. It is the way it was meant to be. It is not doing good things to get to heaven to sing songs to a magical God. Dear God, I hope not. <laughs> in this beautiful world that will be set right in beauty, justice, wonder, and peace. And finally, when I practice this faith, I feel God's presence. He frees me from brokenness. The reality of God is there. It offers me true acceptance. I see in my life more peace, more love, more understanding, and a wisdom to live life well. Let me close with a quote from one of my favorite books, The Princess Bride. <laughs> the quote says this, life is pain. Anyone that says different is selling something. My friends, don't expect to come here and spend a half an hour or 45 minutes talking and hanging out and listening to me, and all of a sudden get some beautiful ideas to fix the world. All right, we're, this is just the beginning step. Look, there are no quick, clean answers to these deep questions that we're talking about. That's what you're here to do in college. You're here to wrestle about it, talk about it. Don't be afraid to get messy. Thank you for your time. You talked about during the Enlightenment period that uh, people moved away from unified, uh, unifying math and art. Do you think that there will be a trend back towards ever, or do you feel like these will further separate uh, as we continue? Or? Oh, I see. Yeah, that, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, I think we've just gotten really rich in the kind of stuff we study. So there's so much math. There's a guy named Gauss, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of him, but he was probably the last mathematician who knew everything about math everywhere. And after him, he was so prolific that after him, nobody could keep up with math. It just got huge. And this is true in biology. If you think about biology, you know, we now know a little bit about microbiology of plants that live in Africa, you know, under this temperature. And that's, that could be your specialty. But biology is so huge, chemistry is so huge, history, art, linguistics, everything is so huge that we can't wrap our minds around it. Right? I think the only danger about the Enlightenment era that I think of is not the fact that things have gotten deep and rich and separated to a certain degree, but that people think that these fields can't come together, and in fact that science is the only way of addressing them. That's my big worry, is that there's nothing wrong with going deep in your world, there's nothing wrong with becoming a doctor or a professor or a lawyer and enriching yourself. But, uh, but to say that the only answer is reason alone, the only answer is science alone, that's my worry. So I think as time goes on, these fields will merge in different ways, right? We're seeing art fixing and working its way towards biology and math and these different things. So that will continue to happen. But the mastery of da Vinci, the one person knowing it all, uh, in terms of this, this concept of engineering and the forefront of art and the forefront of science, the forefront of design, um, is not going to happen. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay, uh, so from the audience, who has questions? 
Go ahead. You want to you want a mic or you want to yell? No, I'll yell. Uh, yeah. Thank you, first of all, for your time. I appreciate it. Um, I'm not sure we actually answered the question of the topic. Does science make faith obsolete? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about the merging of things, art, science, math, yeah. right? Why can't faith can all those things merge? Well? And I think you kind of just mentioned that, right? Yeah. I went there. Yeah, so to me, uh, the question was, uh, to go back to the original question again, does science make faith obsolete, right? right. And, and I guess my answer in my little spiel was that, uh, that I think science is one piece of the puzzle. That to say that science is the only piece of the puzzle is not enough. And uh, so that's one answer. And how that relates to faith is the following thing. I think, I think that we are all people of faith. So if you say that, you know what, science is all you need to answer all the questions in this world, that is a faith claim. To say that there is no God, that is a faith claim, right? So, to me, faith is always present, regardless of your opinions about science. Whether you can say science is alone, and that's enough for it, or science is needed with some other tools, or science is needed with history to understand how God works. So, is it okay to say that you can have faith in more than one thing? Uh, yeah, I have, I have faith in, I mean, to, to say that you only have faith in one thing is dangerous. I have faith in lots of things. I have faith that when I get on a plane, it's going to work. Right, that all the mechanics of that plane, which I don't really understand, what do I know about? You know, dynamics and tension and the electrical circuitry that's going on, that that's going to work. The pilot's mind is going to work. I have faith in those things. So there's lots of things that I have faith in. Absolutely true. Thank you. All right, questions? Go ahead. Thank you, Doctor. Um, thanks for your time. Uh, have you ever been, uh, in the academic community, have you ever been uh, ridiculed for your faith? Uh, and if so, have, can you give us an example? Uh, I guess what I'm uh, hoping for is conviction, or not conviction, but inspiration, because if you're a growing academic, uh, a budding scientist, uh, how do you respond, or, or how do you stay um, strong? So the question is, um, have I ever been ridiculed for my faith in my academic life? And, uh, and any encouragement that you can have out of there? Um, I, gosh. I don't think so. I mean, I, but at the same time, I wasn't speaking like this when I was a grad student. Uh, the reason is because I, um, I... That is the most repulsive thing a Jew can say. It is nauseating. I mean, maybe for us, who've been exposed to multicultural ideas, multi-religious... We're in a pluralistic society in America, right? You have people from all over the world coming and hanging out. And you know, hey, you're a Hindu, that's cool. You're a Buddhist, that's cool. You can just soak in these religions. But to a Jew, that is repulsive. And in the heart of that comes this notion from a group of Jews that there is a man who is God on earth. That to me I find to be amazing that that would happen. So you can say, well, that just, they just did that. I find probabilistically the other way that something miraculous happened for that to have happened in that one time ever. So that's one example. But there's lots of other ones historically that convince me. Go ahead. Um, so you mentioned that you That's right. So like, like what I found was like Zoroastrianism, yes. and how there there are several religions that that um where all see things that they claim that Christianity was like made up by like certain things or like things like like the sun, and that it's like oh of course they would have created this because it's it's like the sun which resurrects and which like how how would you react to this? Oh, you mean the claim of the resurrection of Jesus by saying the sun resurrects, like the sun rises? Well, yeah, like the thing that, that, it's, that it's not a new belief. I see. Um, so, so her question was, what do you think about other faiths that also have some historical roots that make claims about the Christian faith that says it's not that new? Right? Is, is that roughly what, what you're saying? So I, if you actually look at some of the great faiths of the world, to me, the Judeo-Christian faith, and actually Islam, which is sort of a follow-up to that trend, are the only ones that are rooted in historical things. Right? And what I mean by that is the context of how God acts is through history. He acts not independently giving you texts of perfection. He actually act, acts through history, through his people. And so the reason Islam is not attractive to me compared to the Christian faith is that that is the book, if you look at the Quran, it is an amazingly beautiful book. It's really beautiful. Except it's done in one thing. It's written in one language alone. Right? It's written in Arabic. And if you translate the Quran in any other language, that's great, that's cool, it's good to have an English version, but that's not the Quran. 
The Quran is only true, it's only real, it is only God's word in Arabic. Right? And it happened through one man at one time. Now if you look at scripture, if you look at the Jewish and the Christian books, it's a mess. It's written by lots of people over lots of time frames, lots of different languages. And nobody says these different translations aren't true. Behold, I have, you know, you have 30 different translations on your iPhone right, that you can read. And all of them, in some sense, are about the same version of what you're trying to understand. Nobody would say one is holier than the other one. Because we understand the mess. And the reason to me the Christian and the Jewish faith are wonderful is because there's this messiness that God is working through his people. To me, the Quran is too beautiful, it's too perfect, and it's also not historical. It doesn't make historical claims like the way the Jewish faith and the Christian faith looks. Um, talking about, when you talk about the Son and the resurrection, I actually think if you look at it in the context of the Jewish faith, the resurrection is an amazing thing. Look, let me just give you a little snapshot to answer your question about the resurrection, uh, about the sun rising again. If you think about the resurrection as it follows, and, you know, Jesus was not the only Messiah that was there at that time. There were lots of Messiahs. And here's what happens, here's what happens. Anytime a Messiah comes, they make amazing claims. And then, Rome says, oh, you're making claims to be the Messiah, the deliverer of your people? You're going to die. And the Messiah dies. This is tradition. This has happened lots of times. It's historically there. And what happens after a Messiah dies is one of a few things. First, everybody says, dang it, we got the wrong guy. It's the first thing I'm going to do. <laughs> Not once did they ever say, no, wait, he's still the Messiah. Except once. Right? After Jesus died, they kept calling him the Messiah, which doesn't make any sense. The guy is dead. Two, after Messiah is dead, they actually move on to somebody else who's in the familial line. This is the way the Jewish mindset works. So when Jesus is dead, you go to Jesus' brother. Right? He's got the gift. Nobody came to James and said, you're the Messiah. Nobody did. They kept holding on to the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. This to me is amazing. And here's the third thing. When a Messiah is there, a Messiah is supposed to do three things. He's supposed to clean the temple. Restore the temple because the temple represents God's presence on earth. He's supposed to bring justice to the enemies and peace to the nation. Those are the three things the Messiah is guaranteed to do. This is why Rome was so offended because the Messiah is supposed to wipe out the enemies of Israel. That's why Rome slaughtered the Messiah. And when Jesus died, when people said, He is still Messiah after He was dead, if Jesus never rose again, then why would you call Him the Messiah if the temple was never fixed, if peace was never there? And justice was never served. Why would you call him the Messiah? It doesn't make any sense. So to me, it's amazing that even after all this happened, after the temple was not clean, after there was no peace and justice was not there, still people held on to the fact, years and years and years after his death, that he was the Messiah. They never turned to James. They still kept calling him this. To me, I'm convinced that only an amazing thing would have wrought with this in a Jewish nation, in a monotheist world. And that was the resurrection. I have a song hand over here. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I think many uh, scientists um, don't want to take seriously the idea of platonic universals and abstract objects because um, they lack any causal power in the physical world. And so my question is, if God is supposed to be immaterial, um, how does he stand in any causal relationship uh, with us? You think if God is supposed to be immaterial, how does he stand in relationship with us? In some causal, causal relationship. Causal relationship. I don't even know, in all honesty, how to answer that question. So, to me, I don't view God in that sense, I guess, right? I don't view him in that, in this, in the tears. So here's the way I view it, right? My, my notion of God is, is a Jewish notion. It's not a Platonic notion. It's not a Greek notion, right? Where, where somehow God is, um, God is a sort of a spirit part and we're the physical part, right? The Jewish notion is the following thing, that God is a God of creation. He made a, a world. A four-dimensional world, space and time, is format, and he is outside of this world, and he intersects this world and touches it, right, in physical, real ways. And he's done this through history. We call, some of these we call these the miracles. Some of these we call the anointings of the different kings, and it came in the most amazing way in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. So, to me, from a human perspective, that's the way I would be done. All right, uh, go ahead. Um, okay, so, um, I come from sort of a mentality in which, um, whenever I like, see the most of the Christian faith, I'm a strong follower, I'm a strong believer, but at the same time, 
I have a lot of friends who are non-Christian. They are very into the secular, other sort of faiths and whatnot. Now, when it comes to the stories of the miracles that Jesus did, the spiritual healing that he did, and everything that happened, the power of prayer, those sort of things are like those amazing things we hear in scripture, but it's really hard coming from a town where I feel like I have to defend something. I have to like put concrete evidence to support that. Like, in your opinion, like how do you support those healings, those miracles that happen? Like, is there, how do you scientifically say it? Or, yeah. So, you so your question, just talk about. Let's just talk about miracles. So, your question yeah. is, you know, in the Christian faith, it makes sense to you, but yeah. you have friends who aren't Christians mm -hmm. and who are lots of different faiths, yeah. atheists, and whatever, and they ask you questions about the miracles, right? And they say, how do you explain this and defend this in a scientific way? So, you know, gosh, to me, miracles are. So it's interesting. So to me, miracles are God reaching and touching this world. In, through space and time and doing an act. They are clearly historical acts. That's what miracles are, right? They're not metaphysical, and they're not like psychological. They're, they're things that happen. The water turned to wine, or the Red Sea parted, some physical historical thing. Then the question is, how do you measure it? How do you measure history? And if somebody says, how do you prove that scientifically? The answer is you can't. So let's think about this just for a second. How do you prove that Abraham Lincoln got shot? Do you know he got shot when he died? Right in the theater. Well, how do you prove it? I mean, like scientifically, like can we just shoot him over and over again? And then, you know, put him in a test tube. And like, what scientific thing can you do to prove Abraham Lincoln got shot? Well, you all believe it. Like, what scientific thing? It's supposed to be a testable, repeatable experiment. What is that? The answer is you can't do it scientifically. That's not what it was meant to do. You can tell me scientifically what happens to lead when you give it heat. You can tell me scientifically what happens to a skull when you make it contact with. You can do all that stuff. But about Abraham Lincoln actually dying. You have to use history. Right? And you say, well, historically, we have evidence that says he was shot. Look, look at this newspaper clipping that this guy brought, and here's the historical thing, and I trust the validity of that source. Same thing goes to miracles. So you say, I believe in miracles because historically they happen, and there must be sources that are talking about this thing. In other words, do you see miracles today? I've seen them in my eyes. Right? I've seen literally historical things happening in my eyes, namely miracles occur. And so, I can do that, I have friends who've seen it, and there are sources I trust. Does that mean you can have repeatable events and say, God, make the sky light pink, right now, right? You can ask that question, but he is God and you are not, right? So you can ask that question all you want, but it's not a repeatable experience you're gonna have, because he's not one you can control. But, uh, but that doesn't mean he doesn't intersect space and time and can manipulate it. Go ahead. All right, okay, so uh, I, some second friends as well, obviously, but all of us. And I guess uh, one of the things is they're really sincere about wanting, you know, they really want there to be a God, you know, if they die, there is life. Sure. But they can't, they don't feel like there's enough concrete proof. So then why doesn't God just kind of, I guess, put up the sign that says, hey, I'm here, don't stop arguing about that, focus on something else. Oh, so your question is, why doesn't God give us an amazing sign to yes. say that it's God? Like definitively, no one can argue it. Like that nobody can argue with it. You know, I think that that's pretty much impossible. And what I mean by that is the following thing. What sign would you want me to do that is without a shadow of a doubt unarguable? That it's from, like, what would that be? Like, if the sky turned black and the letters came, you know, I am God, is that what All of a sudden people are like, no, I get it. <laughs> I think, you know, even in scripture it says that, uh, that if the prophets haven't convinced you, right, even a dead man rising will convince you. And, uh, and I think there's enough historical evidence to me to convince me that these things happen. That God is real, not just in a past tense, but in a current tense. Um, but what I can't even imagine what miracle that would want. And here's a great example, I think, to, be, to show somebody that God is real. Let's, you be God on earth. You know, forget the miracles, because that's not going to win anybody, because it won't buy me. I might just say, oh, that was just, you know, some special neon gas floating in the world, and some kid did a trick on it, you know, whatever it is. But, but if you represent God on earth, if somebody looks at you and says, hey, man, you are Christ in flesh and blood today. That's what the church represents. The church is Christ on earth today. And a lot of the reasons people struggle with the Christian faith is the fact that you don't see the Christ being the church, being the church is supposed to be. So you be God on earth, and you convince them. Not by any magic words, but by you laying your life down.
Go ahead. So you said, you mentioned the um, Abraham Lincoln example, how you can't prove that he got shot. Scientifically. Scientifically. So you're not committing to that viewpoint that that actually happened? Or you can't prove it? Yeah, so all I'm claiming about the Abraham Lincoln, just to clarify that thing, is that there's nothing in this world that is 100% guaranteed to end. All right? Like, that's all I mean by that. And if you talk about a historical event, the scientificness goes out of there, and now you have to use historical weaker tools. And so I believe Abraham Lincoln did get shot, right? But there's no slam dunk, 100% without worry argument that that happened. We are putting our faith in some things, in historical tools. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. But, uh, but in the, so for the resurrection, that is something that you spoke about a bit That's right. more That's right. adamantly. So That's right. wouldn't you conceive the notion that that Abraham Lincoln case would be on the same level and adhere to the same sort of Perfect, my friend. In the resurrection case, in the Abraham Lincoln case, absolutely true. There's no slam dunk argument that the resurrection happened. Guaranteed. Right? Not at all. But I believe that there's enough evidence for me to get convinced that that makes the most sense. I believe that there's enough right now to convince me that Abraham Lincoln actually did get shot, that that makes the most sense. So there's nothing 100% about the resurrection. There's no scientific argument about the resurrection. But I think there's historical argument to convince me, to make me believe that that's probably what really happened. Same thing with Abraham Lincoln. It's in the same world. Exactly right. Go ahead, Albert, on the side. What about the belief in God that gives you clarity in the, the messiness of life? And what um, about um, God? Uh, what measure um, does that hold? So your question was, what about what is the belief in God that gives me clarity about the messiness of this life? You know, when we as a uh, scientist, when we as people want to talk and measure the world using the scientific framework, I think what we do is we just push the messiness thing away. For example, if you want to talk about notions of justice, why is it that all our hearts want justice? When you see some unjust act going on in the world today, slavery, abuse, even across the world or in your, in your own town, right? Your hearts burn and you want to say, I want to set the world right. Whether it's setting the environment right, the way we're abusing this world today, right? The way we're abusing people today. And I say, okay, what, what is it that, that, that says that that's wrong or right? The science, does, what is it about us that all of humanity thirsts for justice and we sort of agree what justice is, what good is? What is that? And to me, science doesn't say anything. It, it says something like this. It says, you know, we're still thinking about that, figuring it out. And one day, we'll understand our electronic impulses. Maybe it was partly because of evolutionary reasoning that we want to protect ourselves and these kind of things. So there's some answers that it does offer. But it doesn't offer a full picture, a rich picture. And I think there are these bigger answers, if you include God, that it does fulfill it, especially to me, the Judeo-Christian faith, which says, here's why you thirst for justice. Because you are God's reflection. Right? He thirsts for justice, and you're his kid. Here's why you love beauty. Here's why you want the world set in order. Genesis 1, that God is a world of order. Do you love to organize your desk to make it look just right? You know, there's something about it. It's like some people aren't good at it, right? But that doesn't mean that they don't wish that would happen. You don't look at their closet and say, I want to organize this closet. We have a thirst for that thing, because I think that's the way we're made. All right, so it's getting to be that time of night, so we're going to take our last question for the evening. Go ahead, and Nadine. Oh, in the particular case that in terms of evolution, what actually happened? Yeah. That's a great question. In terms of, like, <laughs> technically, like, here is a monkey sort of changing into Homo erectus and the Homo sapiens and man, right? Like, where's the line? I have no clue. I'll tell you, I have no clue. And to me... I'm sorry? I said, so then he could have created it in seven days. Absolutely. Oh, could God have done it in seven days? Oh, my goodness. Bam. Right? 2006, <laughs> hanging out in the seven. Absolutely. I'm not saying God wasn't capable of doing it in seven days. There's absolute, I mean, I believe in a God that is, here's my notion of creation, right? I'm even going to turn it up a notch. Here's my notion of creation. I believe that it's not that God created the world. It's that right now, at this very second, without his actual thought on this universe, it wouldn't exist. The Jewish notion is called sustaining. He sustains the world. He is needed to keep the world, the universe, the universe. 
So my notion of creation isn't like there's God starting it and letting it run, and there's evolution. God's like hanging out, going, "Ooh, I hope the ape works," you know. That's not <laughs> my notion is, and not, it's not even God is like intricately there, playing with his fingers, making that thing work. It is his mind on the universe, or the universe doesn't even exist. It is a sustaining God. It is a Hebrew thought. So this notion is such a radical notion, right? It's not just a when did God start the clock. But let me just answer your question about me not knowing. You know, I don't know a lot of things, a lot of things. And if you ask a scientist, if you ask a physicist, here is all the physics, right? The beginning. This is no physics. This is every possible physics theory in the history of, you know, we could ever know. Where do you think we stand in our knowledge of physics, right? I think if you ask a real physical, you know, a physicist who's actually engaged in research, they would say, we're probably at 2%. We just know almost nothing about physics. I mean, we don't know what dark matter is, we're, we're getting gravity, but we don't even have a grand unifying theory. Like, we're just scratching the surface. If you ask mathematicians, if you ask me, we're just getting that. We don't even have a fold paper. I mean, <laughs> fully serious. The concept of origami folding, it's just brand new. Eric Demain, this 23-year-old kid, is one of the current, you know, gods of this field. We know so little. So if somebody says, yeah, but you are willing to get on an airplane, literally risk your life, getting on that plane, on a theory that we barely know. Right? We don't fully understand electrodynamics, we don't fully get electricity, we don't fully get gravity, and yet you're willing to put your life on that plane? Yeah, I am. That's how I view my faith in God, is that I don't need to know all of it. I don't need to know every second as to God. When did I become? I, didn't need, I don't need to know the Trinity. I don't need to know fully. I know that he's God, three persons, one God. What is that? What do I know? I don't need to know it all to have faith in it. I'm willing to put my faith in something. We all got to do it. And that makes the most sense to me. And did you have any closing remarks you wanted to leave with the audience? Um, thanks. Yeah. I just, I just, there's a story I love to tell. So let me just close today with, with the story. I'll be, I'll be sticking around afterwards if you guys want to come and talk. Um, it's one of my favorite stories. It's the story of Karl Barth. I'm not sure if you guys know this guy. Karl Barth is one of the most famous theologians of the last century. He's probably the, you know, capital T theologian there was in the Christian faith. And this one time, Karl Barth was coming out of a church service, and, uh, and a famous astronomer comes to Karl Barth and says, Professor Barth, says yes, he says, isn't it true, my friend, that all of the Christian faith, in fact, all of religion itself can be summarized in a phrase? And Karl Barth has spent his entire life wrestling with the depths of the Christian faith, much less faith in general, much less these concepts of religion and theology. He says, Wait, you're telling me that there's one phrase that summarizes all of this thing, much less all of the other religions and the deep faiths of the world? What is this phrase, my friend? He goes, well, do good unto others as they would, you would have them do unto you. Isn't that, you know, the golden rule? Isn't that basically the point of religion? And Karl Barth thought about this, and then he's a quick-witted man, so he turned to the astronomer and he said, my friend, isn't it true that all of astronomy can also be summarized in a phrase? And the astronomer just starts laughing. He goes, you're kidding me, right? You're talking about black holes, dark matter, space and time, the curvature, gravity, all of these things, quasars, which we're barely starting to understand. What is this one phrase that can summarize all of astronomy? He says, twinkle, twinkle, little star. How are you? <laughs> and you see, here's the point. The point of the story is the following thing. Look, if you're a Christian and you're struggling with your faith, if you're an atheist, an agnostic, a Muslim, my encouragement is get together and don't trivialize these deep things. And if you have a friend who is an atheist and they're thinking about atheism in a serious way, don't trivialize their faith. Like, walk with them, struggle with them. Look, these are big ideas. 15 minutes of yapping isn't going to do a thing. These are deep things. You can trivialize their thing and have a little, you know, Twitter feed and say, that's all they're talking about. It's easy to cut down other things, but engage with them. Have pizza with them. Take them out to eat. In my to your home. There's intense richness in talking about this. Now's the time to do it like that.